Good each one, warmly welcome to our service this evening. Good to see you with us. And we're going to make a wee start with hymn number 219. Page 265, a ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain, ye must be born again. 219, and let's stand together after the note to sing, please. <laughs> Let's just seek the Lord in prayer this evening, please. Our loving God and <coughs> gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for uh, the words of the hymn that we've been singing together. Lord, we are reminded of that great truth declared there to Nicodemus of old, that ye must be born again. Our Father God, as we come to thee this night, we do rejoice in that way of redemption that has been revealed in the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for that way of redemption that has been purchased for us by the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father God, we thank you tonight that as we read the Scriptures, we read about heaven, and we read about that place called hell. And yet, our Father, for the saint of God, we can rejoice that in that heavenly place we will one day walk those golden streets. Our Father, we think of the words of the hymn writer and how he speaks of heaven. Lord, that there are many that long to walk its streets, but, Lord, they're not saved, they're not washed in the precious blood of the Lamb. Our Father God, tonight as we come to thee, we ask and pray that thou by your Holy Spirit, Lord, be pleased to move in the hearts and minds of men and women, draw them out of their sin and draw them in to that plan of redemption. Our Father, as we seek thy face tonight, we rejoice that we come to the triune God of heaven. We come to that one who is sovereign over all things. We come to that one who knows the end from the beginning. We thank and praise you, Lord, that that title attributed to thee it's also attributed to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
Our Father, we come to thee tonight and we recognize that we as old mortals, Lord, our lives are controlled by time. Lord, we think of the hour, we think of the minutes, we think of the seconds. Lord, we measure our time in this world by the number of years and months that we spend upon it. Yet our Father, tonight we're mindful that our God he is not governed by time. He is not restricted by those limits. We thank you that we have a God that is omnipotent in power. He can do whatsoever he will, and he can do it whensoever he willeth. Our Father, we thank you we come to one who is the all-knowing God. Our Father, tonight you know everything that has taken place. This old world in which you reside. As we gather here, we are limited. We are restricted. We can hear some things about what is happening in some countries. But our God, thou art familiar with all that is happening right across this world this evening. Our Father, most of all, you're interested in the lives of men and women. You're interested in the lives of thy people. We thank and praise you, Lord, that thou art one that can intervene in the affairs of man. Lord, for thy honor and for thy glory. Our Father, tonight we think of those that know thee and love thee. Lord, those that are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And yet this evening finds them laid aside. Lord, they're unable to come out to the house of God. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would come and meet with them. Lord, that thou would encourage their hearts. That thou would touch them physically and in thy will and purpose raise them up to that fuller measure of health and strength. Our Father, we pray that they might know that touch of the Master's hand. And Lord, that very soon they might be back out in our midst again. Our Father in heaven, as we come to thee tonight, we thank and praise you as well for the going forth of thy truth. Lord, we thank you thy word is being declared not merely here, but right across this land in which we reside. And we thank you, Lord, for all that stand behind the sacred desk, for all that open the word of God and declare that salvation is to be found in Christ alone. Our Father, we rejoice in every faithful witness that there is tonight. And we pray, Lord, that as they handle thy word, that thou would grant them help and liberty and power from thyself. Dear Father, God, it is our earnest desire that the very angels in heaven this evening might have that opportunity of rejoicing over those that have got right with thee. Our Father, we come to thee tonight and we do think of this land, this nation in which we reside. We recognize that it needs that moving of the Spirit of God. Our Father, we can read the history books. We can read of the mighty movings of God in, in days past. We can look to the land of Wales and think of the Welsh revival there in the time of Evan Roberts. We can look to the land of England and we can think of the mighty movings of God in the time of Whitfield, in the time of Wesley, in the time of Roland Hill. Lord, as they handle thy word and preach thy truth, thousands gathered to hear the scriptures and Lord, many were saved. Our Father, we think of this land of Ulster. We can look back or we can recall and read about the, the movings of God in 1859. We can read of the moving of God and in the 1920s when W.P. Nicholson was preaching up around Belfast. Dear Father, there was a mighty moving for thyself. Dear Father God, we come to thee tonight and we pray, Lord, that thou would intervene in our land and Lord, that thou would be pleased to do it again. Lord, we look at the land and we can all complain and talk about the shape of it and the state of it. But Lord, we need thee to intervene. Lord, we come to thee and we know that thou art able to do all of these things. Our Father, we pray that thou would move by your Holy Spirit, Lord, in revival power. And yet, our Father, as we come to thee, we're mindful, Lord, that revival begins in the hearts of thy people. Our Father, God, we come to thee tonight and we ask and pray that thou would move on our hearts. Lord, we recognize that we are not what we ought to be. We ask and pray, Lord, that thou would touch our hearts. Give us that greater love for thee. Give us that greater love for the word of God. Give us that greater desire for the, the place of prayer. And Lord, give us that greater love for the souls of men and women. Our Father, we come to thee tonight. We recognize the need of our land and our nation. We come to thee, we cry unto thee, that thou would intervene for thy honor and for thy glory. Our Father, we think of Daniel of old as we read of him in Scripture, and there he pleads, he, he intercedes for the nation of Israel. We think of the Apostle Paul and how he could cry out in the book of Romans and say, my heart's desire, my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Dear Father, that's our desire for this land. Lord, that's our desire for our friends and family. Lord, that's the desire of our heart for men and women around us here in Cash. Lord, that they might be saved. Our Father God, we pray that thou would help us to, to cry unto thee in prayer, to be instrumental in presenting the gospel before them. And Lord, we pray that thou by your spirit would move for thy honor and for thy glory. Our Father in heaven, continue with us this night, we do pray. 
Lord, as we prayed, remember those that are sick. We remember those that grieve at this time as well. We ask and pray that thou would comfort and strengthen them. We think of the Bradshaw family circle, the Johnson family. Lord, we ask and pray that thou would come alongside. Lord, that in their time of grief and heaviness, Lord, that they might know the comforting hand of the God of heaven. They might know that one who can uh, take away the sting of death as it were. But Lord, give them that peace. Give them that contentment there in their hearts at this time. Father, tarry with us tonight. Bless us as we sing the hymns of Zion. Bless us, Lord, as we meet around thy word. Over us neath the precious blood. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask all of these things. Amen. Returning to our second hymn this evening, it's 275. Page 287, O what a Saviour that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son, saith he, hath everlasting life. 275, and let's stand to sing, please. Turning tonight for scripture reading to Matthew's Gospel, and we're turning to the chapter 18. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, and we're beginning a reading at the verse 1 of the chapter. 
There we read, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this as, as little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offences, for it must needs be that offences come. But woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet, to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if it be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of the Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And we end our reading there at the close of verse 22, and we know that God will bless his own truth to each one of our hearts this evening. At this point, we want to extend a warm word of welcome to each one that's gathered with us, and we trust and pray that we know the Lord's blessing as we tarry here in his house this evening. And once again, we want to extend to the Johnson family on behalf of the minister or the church session and church committee of the church here, a word of sympathy in the passing of Mrs. Bradshaw, and we assure them in the family circle of our prayers and our thoughts at this time. Now please do remember some announcements for the incoming week. Uh, Tuesday night, God willing, will be a session and committee meeting here in the church at 8 p.m. Then Wednesday night is our prayer meeting and Bible study, and we do invite God's people, we do encourage them to come along and to meet with us at the place of prayer. Thursday night is a children's meeting at 7 and for the boys and girls. And again, do pray for that work amongst the children. And then the service is next Lord's Day, half 11 in the morning, 7 p.m. in the evening. Uh, both services preceded by a season of prayer. And the speaker next Lord's Day will be Mr. David Wilson, a sentient of our college. And then do remember the Easter Convention. It hasn't taken place in our church over the past number of years because of COVID. And that is recommencing. And the Friday night service is on the 15th of April at 8 p.m. And it will take the form of a missionary and a youth rally with the speaker being the Reverend Ian Harris and a number of reports taking place and singing as well. So please do remember that meeting. Do pray for it. And if at all possible, do plan to attend 
And then the Monday service is at the evening time of 7 p.m., Monday the 18th, and the speaker there is the moderator, the Reverend John Armstrong. So please do remember these services uh, and do plan to attend them, if at all possible, and pray for them, that the Lord would use them uh, for his honor and for his glory. Uh, I look back many years ago to sitting on the steps on a Friday night at one of those Easter conventions, and the Lord challenged me about what I was doing with my life, and I still recall where I was sitting, looking down and listening to the preacher, and the Lord used that occasion to speak to my heart. And it was a challenging time. So we do pray that the Lord would even use those meetings again to speak to the hearts and minds of men and women. There's also a day of prayer for the Christian schools. That's on the 30th of April. And that's taking place in our Porter Down Church. And it starts at quarter past ten in the morning, running through to a quarter past one. And there are also a number of magazines available if you haven't got your copies out in the ports. The Vision magazine is there, the current magazine, and also the Ulster Bulwark as well. So please pick them up on your way out tonight. And do also remember the sick of the church. There are a number that are laid aside. I do pray for them that the Lord would touch them and raise them to health and strength again. We also have uh, some information from Let the Bible Speak. As you know, they do broadcast on the television now, and they have a recording studio up in our Lurgan Church. And they're asking for help for volunteers, if there are people that would be interested in helping out. They have a couple of jobs that require, are required. Uh, full training will be given to them. There's a non-technical role. It's helping out with cables. And then there's another of assembling and dismantling camera equipment. And if you happen to be free and are able to do that in the evening time, they would appreciate your help. And if you want any more information, let me know. And I can pass you on the name or the contact details regarding the individuals concerned. And both of these roles are open to men or women, volunteers, and whenever required, food training will be given. So please do bear that in mind if you're interested in helping out with that recording up there in Lurgan. These are all of the announcements, and they're each one subject to the will of God. Turning to hymn number 215 for offering him, page 263, Years I spent in vanity and pride, he caring not my Lord was crucified, Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary 215 and just keep your seats while your offering for the Lord's work is received. <laughs>
I can invite you once more to turn to Matthew's Gospel, into the chapter 18. And with the scriptures open before us, let's just seek the Lord in prayer, please. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before thy open book this evening, we ask and pray for thy help. We ask, Lord, that as we come to consider this little text within it, the Lord, that thou would speak to each one of our hearts. Our Father God, we pray for these moments that thou would focus our attention on the things of God. Lord, close out the thoughts of yesterday. Close out the plans for tomorrow. And Lord, for these moments we pray that we might meet with thee, that we might be encouraged, that we might be strengthened, that we might be challenged in the things of God. Our Father, I come to thee this night and I pray that thou would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Grant us, Lord, that utterance, that help that cometh from thee, that all we might say might be unto thy honour and to thy glory. Tarry with us and cover us neath the blood. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we ask all these things. Amen. As we come to the Word of God, in particular the New Testament, we notice time and again that the Lord Jesus Christ took a great interest in the boys and girls. Often time we will quote those words that are found there in Luke's Gospel in the chapter 18 and the verse 16. There we read, But Jesus called unto them, and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. We think of that particular account and how as the boys and girls were coming to the Savior, the disciples drove them away and the Savior rebuked them. He wanted to meet the little children. He wanted to see them and he wanted to talk to them. As we come to this chapter 18 in Matthew's Gospel, we find again that the Lord Jesus Christ brings before us the importance of the children. You will notice here as you look at this chapter that he speaks in the opening verses of the children. And then a little bit further down there in verses 12 to 14, you have that interesting account of the farmer or the shepherd with a hundred sheep. And there the Lord says if that shepherd has a hundred sheep and he loses one, he goes out, he searches for it until he finds it. And then you will notice the words of verse 14. Even so is it not the will of your father which is in heaven that not one of these little ones should perish. And that brings to your attention and mind the importance that the Lord Jesus Christ placed upon the children. They were not someone to be dismissed, to be set aside, but rather they were vital and important in his earthly ministry. He took notice of them and had a desire to see them saved and valued their life and everything about them. As we come to this chapter, we find in the opening verses that the disciples are talking. These 12 disciples have gathered together. They're not talking about theology. They're not discussing the best way of reaching the multitudes. Rather, as we read the opening verse, we find that the disciples are discussing as to who is the greatest. And they ask the Savior the question. They say there in verse 1, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And it would seem that the design amongst the disciples was that they wanted to know which of them was the most important. They were wondering when it came to the time of residing in heaven, what position would they have? Where would they be in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ? Would they have a a high position? Would they have a low position? Where would they be? Would they be able to sit beside the Savior as was the request of one mother for her two sons? When they asked the question of the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't just answer them in the way they desired. Rather, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ takes a little child and uses this little child as a means to rebuke the carnal thinking of these disciples. And as a means of illustrating the way of salvation. And so for a few moments this evening, I want to direct your attention to the words that are found there in verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I want to just look at this little text of scripture and notice the subject of conversion and a little child. As we read these verses, we see, uh, first of all, the importance of conversion. As we've said already, the disciples asked this question of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, with regard as to who was being the greatest. The Lord Jesus Christ sidestepped the, un- the answer or the question that they gave him. He didn't answer it. Rather, he brought them down to earth in another way. The Lord Jesus Christ took the little child. He, he put them into the midst. And he said, if the child here, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. The verse 4 leads on. It says, whosoever shall therefore humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
The Lord Jesus Christ was saying to the disciples, you're arguing amongst yourselves. You're seeking after carnal glory. You're full of your own self-importance. But here's a little child. And except you humble yourself like that little child, then that's the only way you'll be great in the kingdom of God. You need to set aside that, that spirit of pride, that spirit of self-importance. And rather, you need to embrace a humble heart and a humble desire. In this verse, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ uses that word converted there in verse 3. When you look at that word in the original Greek, it, it simply means to turn around. You could almost rewrite the verse and, and say there, except you be turned and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the indication is here that mankind by nature needs to turn around. If you need to turn around, well, obviously you're going the wrong way. Uh, maybe you've been using this app now. And sometimes you go past a turn or you decide to go a different route and it starts to point you that you need to find a place to turn around. Well, the Lord is saying here for mankind in this world today, they need to turn. The indication is from that language, when they need to be converted, they need to turn around. The implication is that mankind by nature is going the wrong direction. And that is the case. Man is born into this world as a sinner. And we recognize that man heads on after his own selfish ambitions. He heads after the things that, that please himself. And oftentimes those are the things that are contrary to the God of heaven. As we read the scripture, we are reminded that man, by nature, has his back to where God. He's not following God. He's not seeking to please God. He, he doesn't love God. Rather, he goes after the things that he wants. He's following after the plans of the devil. As we look at that and consider this in the light of this little text, we are reminded that men and women need to be turned. And when the Spirit of God begins to work in the hearts and minds of the unconverted, the hearts and minds of sinners, it's only then that they recognize their fallen nature. Many today in our world, they, they think they're okay. You ask them, are you a good person? Are you, are you ready for heaven? And they'll say, well, I'm not too bad. I'm reasonably good. I, I, I try my best. I, I try to, to live by my own laws and live by a good standard. But on the sight of God, we're all sinners. You see, we recognize as we look at the scripture that mankind needs a whole change of nature. And in all for ourselves, we can do nothing to attain merit in the sight of God. We cannot stir up faith in our heart. We cannot stir up a fear of God in our heart. We cannot stir up love toward God of our own nature. We need the intervention of the Spirit of God. And the Savior reminds us of that. Over in John's Gospel, in the chapter 15, we have that picture of the vine. The Lord Jesus Christ presents himself. He uses the illustration that he is the true vine. And there in the verse 5 we're told, For without me ye can do nothing. And there we have that picture of the sinner. That man or woman born into this world by natural generation. In and of ourselves we can do nothing to turn ourselves to God. We are powerless. We are hopeless. We need to be changed. We need to be born again. We are sinners, we are corrupt, we are polluted in the sight of a thrice holy God. And we can merit nothing before the triune God of heaven. The prophet Isaiah in the chapter 64, he sums up what mankind is like. He says, but we are all as an unclean, unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah says there, as you look at mankind, he He's a message from the Lord. We are all as an unclean thing. That's our natural condition. That's our natural estate. We're rebels against the God of heaven. We're mindful of Isaiah and the experience that he himself had there in the chapter 6 of that book. You remember what happened? He got that view of heaven. He saw the cherubim. He saw one high and lift, mighty and high and lifted up sitting upon the throne. The cherubim, the seraphim were crying out, holy, holy, holy. And there is Isaiah, got a vision of that. He speaks of himself in the verse 5. And he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What a picture of the sinner there. As the Spirit of God enlightens the human mind that we recognize our sin and we see the holiness of God, we recognize how far short we fall. We are all unclean. We're all wretched creatures in the sight of a holy God. It matters not who the man may be. It matters not who the woman may be. 
It doesn't matter how society views them, how elevated they are in the eyes of the general public. It matters not how they're viewed in a financial standing. If they're outside of Christ, if they're unconverted, then they're the children of wrath. They're underneath the condemnation of a thrice holy God and they need to be converted. They need to be changed. They need to be turned around. They need to be saved to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. What is conversion? Well, conversion is not a changing of churches. It's not a changing of denominations. It's not a a changing of ourselves by self-effort to try and improve and, and make ourselves better. It's not a changing of lifestyle or a changing of doctrines. Conversion is revealed to us here. It is a changing that takes place by the grace of God. It's a changing who rules in our life. It's a changing of master. It's a changing of authority. It's a changing of who we answer to and who we submit to. It's turning from our own idolatry, our own idols, and it's turning and being submissive to the God of heaven. Again, the prophet Isaiah in the chapter 55 and the verse 7, he says this, Let the wicked forsake his way on the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And that's the cry that is needed. That's the cry for our world and our, our land and our nation today, that men and women would forsake their way, turn from their wickedness, turn to the God of heaven, that they would be converted, that they would turn around. You see, as we think of what man is and is not really state, he is one, as we've said, with his back toward God. Satan is his master at that time. Paul writing there to the church at Ephesus, he reminds them there in that chapter too, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And that was the estate of us all. We were under the control of the devil. He had control. He reigned. He ruled in our lives. The things that he wanted, we did. But now when a man or woman's converted, that changes. They have a new master. The Bible reminds us that you cannot serve two masters. You're either serving God or you're serving the devil. And for those that are saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb, you're serving the God of hell. Not only was Satan once our master, but sin was our master. Paul speaking to those in Rome in the chapter 6 and the verse 16. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye ye yield ourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There again he's indicating that case of who's our master. Who do we submit to? Who is controlled in our life? What, What or who do we give in to at every turn round? They're the master. They are our God, as it were. And if it is sin, if we keep giving in to sin, if we seek following the pathways of sin, then sin is ruling and reigning in our lives. And such is the estate of men and women when they're unconverted. Sin is the master. Sin has control. Sin dominates. Sin rules within their lives. And the cry is to be converted. And when a person's converted, that changes. The other master that you and I can have in our lives not only is there Satan and sin, but there is self. Oftentimes we want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. We have our own plans. We have our own setup, our own thoughts in our mind of where we want to be and what we want to do. And we're following after that. We hear of those today and they're termed self-made men. And that is the desire of many. I, I want to do my own thing. I want to go my own way. We can be selfish. And the natural man is selfish. The natural individual born into this world, they they want to please themselves. They have no interest in pleasing anyone else. They just want to do what suits themselves. The Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6 there, he makes the comment. He says, you love them that love you. What think of you? All men do the same. You do good to them that do good to you. What think of you? All men do the same. You lend to those from whom you hope to receive something in return. What think of you? All men do the same thing, but I say unto you, love your enemies. You see, the natural man pleases himself, but the Christian is to be different. The man or woman who has been converted, we have a different master. We have the master who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our aim, our desire is to please him. We are no longer under the control of Satan. We're no longer under sin. We're no longer under self. Our lives are surrendered. They're submitted to the God of heaven. We've been converted. 
And here the Lord Jesus Christ, as he speaks these words to the disciples and to those that are listening, he's saying, except ye be converted. There has to be that change. There has to be that turning around. There has to be a forsaking of sin. There has to be a forsaking of self. There has to be a forsaking of the devil. And there has to be that embracing of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the scripture says, whenever we become a child of God, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that's the case for the Christian. As we look at the scripture, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ intervened in lives and, and they were changed and transformed. John's gospel in the chapter 3, we have Nicodemus, a self-righteous man, a religious man. There he comes and he meets with the Savior by night asking about eternal life. And the Lord Jesus Christ explains the matter. He reveals to him that while he is an educated man, while he knows the scripture, he's missed out in the fact that he needs to be born again. He needs to be saved by the grace of God. God's grace did work in the life of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was saved, and as we come to the time of the crucifixion, we find him there with Joseph of Arimathea. And what is he doing? He's going in before the governor. He's pleading for the, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that he might prepare it for death. What a change. A man who previously came in, sneaking into the house in the middle of the night, didn't want to be seen, didn't want to be noticed. And then we have him going in a public way before the Roman governor. Something's changed in his life. He's converted. His life was changed, it's transformed by the grace and the mercy of God. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, you have a whole different scenario. The Savior there, he comes to Jacob's well and he encounters a woman She's not a religious woman as Nicodemus was. She's not educated and, and schooled in the scriptures of the Old, and Old Testament as Nicodemus was. She's a woman who comes with her jar. She's looking water. She's an immoral woman. And there as the Lord Jesus Christ communes with her, he reveals to her that the greatest need of her heart is not water that she can drink, but the living water. The water of life that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there as he communes and speaks with that woman, we find that her life too is transformed. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, and the verse 39, it tells us, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. There's conversion, a changing of life, a changing in the life of Nicodemus, a transformation in the life of a, an immoral woman. You think of the Philippian jailer. There we read in the scriptures in Luke six or Acts 16 of how he, he imprisoned Paul and Silas. They were beaten, they were chained, they were put into the prison. And then God moved in that place. And we find that man coming out and he has a question upon his mind and it is, how can he be saved? How can he know eternal life? What must I do that, to be saved? And there the apostle Paul reveals to him, the way of salvation is found in Christ alone and we find that his life was changed. He's not beating him anymore. Acts 16 and the verse 33, we're told, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing on God with all his house. There's conversion. It takes a man, it takes a woman. Changes them, transforms them, makes them into new creatures in Christ Jesus. Their life is different. And that is the command for men and women today in our world. They need to be converted. If they desire peace with God, if they desire eternal life, if they desire to enter the kingdom of heaven, then they need to be saved. They need to be converted. They need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. We also have here the nature of conversion. Lord Jesus Christ, while he speaks of being converted, he says, and become as little children. You'll notice the text doesn't say there they're to be like little children. It says they're to become as little children. They're not to be like little children and that they're selfish. They're not to be like little children and that they're fickle and, and need to be looked after and cared and nursed as a little child does. But he said they're to be as children. They are to display in their lives the, the humility that is mentioned here in the verse 4. They are to display in their lives that teachable nature that is found within the child. They are to display within their lives that, that trusting nature, that obedient nature that is found in the life of the child. That's what Christ desires here. Now we recognize that 
When a child is born into this world, they have sin in their heart. They're not perfect. But the child, as we look on them, there is a degree of innocence there. They are not entangled in the sins of this world. They're not immersed in the evil and the wickedness of this world. That child, as you look at them and listen to them, they're not trying to impress anybody. Whenever they speak, they simply say what comes to mind. And there may be times when they say things and you'd rather they didn't. You say, don't say that. They can come out with things. It comes into their head. It just comes straight out. They're not trying to impress. They're not trying to please. They're, they're not trying to be something they're not. The young child brought up in a home with a loving family, they learn to trust. They, they don't fear. They don't live in the house filled with fear. They trust their parents to, to look after them, to care for them, to provide all of the things that they need. There's a love in the heart of that child. To throw out the arms and they want a hug. That's the nature of the child. There's a compassion there. Maybe you've had the opportunity and the child has done something and you pretend to cry and you see the lip going down and them, they're going to cry too. They're all annoyed. They've upset you. There's an innocence there. There's a tenderness there. There's a compassion there. And that's what the Savior's speaking about. You see, here as he addresses these disciples, he's, he's telling them they, they need to be more like this little child. We think of the humility that is mentioned here. Humility needs to be found in the heart of the sinner. No man or woman can be saved if they don't come with a humble heart. A man or woman that comes to the Savior and their heart is filled with pride and they feel that they deserve to be saved, well, they're coming with the wrong attitude. There has to be a humility. A recognizing that we are sinners. A recognizing an inability to do anything for themselves. A recognition that there is but one who can help, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and a coming and a falling at his feet. In Matthew chapter 15, we read about the Canaanite woman. She comes to the Savior. Her daughter is possessed with a devil. And the Lord Jesus Christ, because she's a Canaanite woman, he, he says he was only sent to the Jews. And she comes and she pleads with him. And he says, but I'm not sent to the Canaanites, as it were. And she says, but even the dogs feed in the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She came. She was pleading. She came with humility. She recognized that she could do nothing for her daughter. She needed the intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ. She came humbly pleading and asking that he would move and touch her daughter. So it is for the sinner as you come before God, you come humbly. Augustus top lady put those words in his hymn, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And that's where the sinner must be tonight. If you want to walk the golden streets of heaven, if you want to bask in God's glory, then you need to be saved. There needs to be that humble heart. A recognition that we have nothing to offer a thrice holy God. As we think of humility here, that is to be the portion of the child of God as well. You and I that are saved tonight, we recognize we're not saved because of who we were. We're not saved because of what we did. We're not saved because of how hard we pray or how holy we feel ourselves to be. We're saved simply because God put his grace and mercy upon us. We're no different from anyone else. God in grace and mercy touched us. He lifted us out of the, the miry clay. He set our feet upon the solid rock, Christ Jesus. And for you and I that know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, there ought to be that humble submission to the God of heaven in all that he petitions us to do. Where is the greatest example of humility? It's in the life of Christ. We see him there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke 22 and the verse 42. His prayer is, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Child of God, as we look at our Savior, there was a humble spirit. There was a submissive spirit. That ought to be found in us. Just as the Savior said, not my will, but thine be done. Is that the cry of our hearts? As God speaks to us from the word, as God challenges us about our lives and our witness for him, do we say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do? Is there humility there? We think of the child and there's trust there. The child trusts the parents. The little child never questions the parent. He'll never say to the parent, is that, is that food good for me? Is it of sufficient nutritional value to, to help me grow and to thrive? He never asks those questions. 
The child will uh, never question the safety, uh, the ability of the parents to look after them or care for them. The parent just lifts them in the arms, carries them about. The child trusts the parents to do everything right. They do it all without question. And the Lord is saying here, just as that child trusts the parents, so we are to trust the Lord. And if we're honest with ourselves, maybe there are times when we don't trust the Lord. Maybe there are times when we question him. We say, Lord, do you know what's going on in my life? Lord, why are you bringing me this way? Why have I all of these problems? Lord, why have I all of these difficulties? Lord, do you not care? Become, become like the disciples in the midst of the storm when they said, Lord, do you care not that we're perishing? We don't trust the Lord. And when you think about it, who are we? As earthly parents, our children trust us. And we are, we're fallible individuals. We make mistakes. We make errors. And how much more, if an innocent child can trust a parent, how come we can't trust the living God of heaven, the creator of the world? We not trust him in all his plans and in all his purposes in our lives. Why do we have to question so much? The Lord, as he says to the disciples here, become as little children. There was to be humility. There's to be trust. We're to trust our heavenly father. The hymn writer put it this way. He said, when we walk with the Lord, in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that's the challenge for us as God's people. To trust the Lord. To obey the Lord. Our Heavenly Father calls us to trust him. Calls us to follow after him. But as we think of the child, we're reminded that the child is teachable. Little children have an amazing ability to, to learn. They learn by what you do. They mimic the actions that they see the parents doing. They, they'll repeat the words that they hear you using. And sometimes again, they do things that you don't want them to do. Maybe you stick out the tongue and the next thing they do, the same back at you. They learn all of those things. They're teachable. They have a mind like a sponge, takes in everything they see and, and everything they hear. And the Lord is saying to the disciples here, that to become as little children, we're to be teachable. There is to be that desire in our hearts that, that we would learn. That we would learn from the Lord. That we would seek to know what he would have us to do. That, that we would listen and be instructed by him. In Acts chapter 10, we read the account of Cornelius and Peter. Cornelius was the Roman centurion of the Italian band. He wanted to meet with Peter and the Lord spoke to him in a vision. And Peter comes and the, the two men commune with each other. And Cornelius was saved. In Acts 10 and the verse 33, we find the words of Cornelius. He says, now therefore we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Here's Cornelius He's saying, I want you to teach me. He's saying to Peter, we're here gathered. My family's here. My, uh, my servants are here. We're saved. We're converted. Teach us. Tell us how we ought to live. Tell us how being a Christian impacts upon my life as an individual. Tell me how it affects my family. How does it affect me as I do my business? How does it affect me in my work? He wanted to be taught. And therefore, you and I, as God's people, we need to be taught. We need to be willing to be taught. We need to be saying, Lord, Lord, teach me. Give me a teachable spirit. None of us know it all. Even in the Christian life, we don't know everything. And sometimes the Lord has to bring us different ways to, to teach us new skills, to teach us patience, to teach us long-suffering, to teach us new things from him. We are to have that teachable spirit. As we think of the child as well, there is to be obedience. Parents are never happier than when the child does what they're told. When they tell the child to do something, they listen, they obey, the parent is happy with that. It's never a pleasant experience when the child rebels, when there's a tantrum and a, and a kicking, a screaming that they, they don't want to do that. They are to obey the children, parents. Scripture reminds us of that. But when we take the same truth and apply it to the heart of us as adults, as God's people, do we always obey? As the Lord challenges us from his word, do we quietly move into line and do what we're supposed to do or do we have to be pulled in, kicking and screaming, as it were? Do we like to obey the Lord or do we rebel against it? The Lord Jesus Christ uttered these words. He addresses them to the disciples. 
And it's an interesting comment when you look at it because he says to the disciples, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. All the disciples were converted except for Judas, and yet the Lord brings this word to their hearts. He's reminding them of their conduct. He's reminding them of their behavior. And there, as a little child, there's humility, there's trust, there's obedience, there's a teachable attitude. It may not be the same in our hearts as God's people. That's a challenge to us. As we think of the child and how it behaves, we have to ask ourselves, am I in that manner before the Lord? Am I obedient? Am I trusting the Lord in everything? Am I depending upon him wholly for every aspect? aspect of my life just as the child would trust the parent and if we're not then we need to come before the Lord and repent of our feelings and ask the Lord to, to draw us closer on to him that we might be those that live and act in that obedient manner before him that we might be those that obey him and everything that he brings to attention that we might be those that humbly submit to his will and take the path that he would have us to go maybe there's one listening in tonight and you're unconverted there is a word for you here. You need to be converted. You need to humbly bow before the Lord. There's no other way. There's no other means of salvation except through Christ. Submit to his will. Recognize that by his atoning death on the cross of Calvary, Christ has purchased redemption for us. And come and cry out unto him for mercy, for pardon, for forgiveness. And know that salvation that's found in Christ alone. We trust and pray that the Lord will bless these thoughts to each of our hearts and challenge us even anew and afresh this evening. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 233 in closing. Once again, the gospel message from the Savior you have heard. Will you heed the invitation? Will you turn and seek the Lord? 233, we'll stand to sing and we'll just sing verse 1, verse 3 and verse 5, please, standing as we sing. Father in heaven, we pray tonight for any that are listening in that are unconverted. Our Father in heaven, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would touch their lives and tenderly and lovingly draw them unto thyself. Our Father God, as we think of this challenge laid before the disciples, 
We ask and pray that we might each take it to heart. Lord, that as the scripture exhorts us, Lord, let a man examine himself. And may we look within and see where we stand with thee. Lord, if there are things to be corrected, Lord, may we do that to thy honor and to thy glory. Our Father, as we leave my house this evening, we ask and pray that you take each one to their various homes in safety. And Lord, we pray that thy people might know that by you in blessing. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, resting, remaining, and abiding upon them. For in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Thank you.